Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, Zoom presentation by uh, Dr. Scott Bovard. Um, I'm Kit Tilly from the Bitterroot Climate Action Group, and this uh, presentation is co-sponsored by Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, and they are represented tonight by Marion Kummer, who will be speaking briefly about her group after I uh, talk about uh, BCAG, or Bitterroot Climate Action Group. Um, our group is a Bitterroot Valley group uh, of concerned citizens um, who are uh, trying to take action uh, on a local level to uh, mitigate and perhaps slow the uh, climate change. And among the things that we've done is uh, create a science primer describing the conditions in the Bitterroot Valley and um, some of what's likely to happen with climate change based on the Montana Climate Assessment and some other sources. Um, uh, we've also uh, donated some HEPA filters uh, for cleaning air to some needy elderly folks at the Burnt Fork Manor. Uh, we've initiated a highway cleanup uh, and the next one will be on September 30th, um, meeting at 10 a.m. at Wally Crawford Fishing Access if you're interested in being part of that. And we also have a member membership meeting coming up, uh, which will be October. 13th at 5 p.m. will be outdoors at um, the O'Hara Commons. And uh, this would be a chance for um, locals to uh, local members to find out more about ways that they can engage in activities of uh, BCAG. Uh, we have a website that has a lot of information about these and other activities and uh, also some sor sources of information on climate change. And if you wanted to contribute <laughs> any amount of money uh, uh, to support these activities, plus our um, you know, web costs and things like that, uh, you can do so through the website. Um, one of the things that we have done that has been very successful over time has been to organize these uh, presentations, which were first uh, in person, and then we had to switch to Zoom based on the uh, pandemic. And we're hoping that if uh, <coughs> things get better, that we can go back to in-person presentations. But until then, this is the way things are going. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Marion uh, to talk about her organization. And then I will briefly introduce Scott before he gives his talk. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm talking about, I'm a board member for Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate. And we're uh, looking, always looking for members. Anybody that has a whiff of association with health is welcome to sign up. Um, we have a newsletter that comes out every other month, and it has things that you can do uh, for climate change. We also uh, put, occasionally send out emails to people. Um, and we're always looking for members. Uh, this will make our organization more robust and also um, allow us to be able to uh, get grants. Our current one of our current programs is through the EPA flag, it's called the EPA flag program. And we got a grant from the American Academy of Pediatrics. I should say I'm a retired pediatrician who practiced in Billings for 36 years. So the American Academy of Pediatrics, we're like this. But anyway, we got this grant and what it involves, it's to, uh, it's to increase awareness for air pollution, especially for children. And what it involves is every day you check the air quality index and then depending on what it is, you raise the color of flag. And then depending on what color flag that determines what kind of outdoor activities would be healthy for uh, people to do, especially school age kids. So right now we're trying to find schools, organizations, businesses who uh, would want to participate in that program. Um, we provide the flags for free, the polls for free. If you need an air monitor, because there's many areas in Montana that don't 
aren't near air monitors. Um, we can provide those and we provide uh, presentations. So um, after I get done talking, I'm gonna put in the chat the website for Montana Healthy Professionals for a Healthy Climate and also um, my email. So if anybody has any contacts we, for schools especially, we'd be very interested in contacting them. That's it. Okay, um, uh, back to me. Uh, so first, a couple ground rules, please, uh, during the presentation, um, mute, your, um, mute yourself. And second, if you have questions, please enter them into the chat. Uh, and then Scott will address those at the end so that it doesn't disturb his flow and he can't see the chat while he's um, speaking. Uh, just a brief introduction on Scott. Um, he's uh, currently a small animal veterinarian who's transitioned from uh, a horse uh, a veterinarian based on uh, both lifestyle and uh, health reasons. and. Uh, as somebody who has a horse, I can understand not wanting to work with an 1100 pound animal who can uh, knock you down just by moving its head uh, to, because of a fly. Um, he's also been involved uh, at some level uh, with some wild animals, in, including birds of prey. Uh, he's, uh, uh, besides uh, being a veterinarian and expert on uh, animal health issues, He's also a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby, so he is well um, acquainted with the issues related to climate change. And because of this unique ju juxtaposition, um, he was recommended as a good person to give a, a talk on um, climate change effects on animal health. And without any further uh, time wasted, go ahead, Scott, and please mute yourselves. Oh, am I muted? No, not you. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you. It's it's a privilege to be here tonight. Um, I appreciate the time everybody's taken to be here. It's, it's exciting for me to, to talk uh, to you in a presentation like this. I've never done something like this before. So uh, unfortunately, my tech savvy wife is here to help me in case uh, my computer tries to explode. But um, as Kit said, I'm a small animal vet in Missoula. Uh, I was a horse vet, but uh, I guess after 20 plus years, I got tired of wrestling thousand pound horses and transitioned to uh, small animals. I have done some wildlife work, but I don't want to give the impression that I'm a wildlife veterinarian. Um, that's just been more of a side note to my career. Um, first, I want to thank uh, um, all the other groups, uh, Montana Health Professionals and Citizens Climate Lobby and, and the Bureau of Climate Action Group for uh, moving the needle on climate education as much as they have already. Nothing I say here today is gonna be rocket science. Um, most of you could have found 90% of the information I'll present on Dr. Google. And I can happily say that if I rarely, if ever see many of the animal disease I'll talk about tonight, why? because most of the diseases we talk about are not common in Montana. But this may change in the near future if climate change continues on its current pace. Um, the simple fact that I and your hometown veterinarian um, uh, have formal degrees in veterinary medicine means you give me some automatic credibility uh, talking about animals and health. Um, the same could be said of 97% of our climate scientists that have already spoken on the topic of climate change. The research has been done, the verdict is in, climate change is here, it's real, we know the cause and we know the solutions. But the question is, do we have the political will to address the problem? So now I'm gonna start my presentation, so we'll switch over to screen sharing. Um, so I was, once again, I was asked by Montana professionals in BCAG to present a perspective on climate change as it relates to animals. So I'll talk about how you can be involved in climate change advocacy near the end of my talk. Of course, this is a pretty broad topic, but I think one that could be very valuable. Many of us have relationships with our pets that parallel our relationships with our friends and our family. Most of us passionately care about the well-being of animals, wild and domestic, 
we never know what will trigger an individual to pay attention to the topic of climate change. We may be talking to a person who has a profound love of her dog, his or her dog, or horse, or trout stream, or is an avid hunter. And if they see effects of, be quiet, Yuki. <laughs> And if they see the effects of climate change affecting animals in their homes, it could be a powerful way to start a discussion. The human animal bond with our pets is very strong, as is the desire to hunt and fish in Montana. So let's start out with some foundational thoughts from some great thinkers that can frame my discussion. First, I'd like to prepare or warn you, for better or worse, this presentation is truly a mile wide and an inch deep, um, but hopefully it will present or plant some seeds for your future reading thoughts and conversations. The author E.B. White famously said the following, every morning I awake torn between a desire to save the world and an inclination to savor it. This makes it hard to plan the day. But if we forget to savor the world, what possible reason do we have for saving it? In a way, the savoring must come first. So my question to you, what do you savor? Why do you care about climate change? This 19th century, Irish scientist demonstrates that some very basic facts of climate scientists, science has been known for quite a while. This is definitely a science-based struggle, but if science was truly the only factor in the mix, we would be decades further down the road to solving the climate crisis. Economics, I'm certainly not an economist, but it's clear that the economics of taking action and climate change have been studied. The Stern Report was commissioned by the British government and led by economist Nicholas Stern in 2006. The massive report addressed climate change and its impact on the global economy versus what would happen if the world continued emitting carbon pollution unchecked. The condensed answer is that there is a cost to addressing climate change. Climate or change is hard, but not addressing it is really not an option if we want to leave a livable planet for our children. I just wanted to bring attention to this and many other reports to demonstrate that addressing climate change is infinitely more economical than ignoring it and going about business as usual. Unfortunately, if we go down too far down the road, we may not be able to just simply click our heels and go back to Kansas. So I'm sure you were all wondering how I was going to tie in Dorothy with an eco economic study of climate change, but I hope it worked. James Hansen sounded the alarm in 1988 to the U.S. Senate. He was one of the first advocates for carbon fee and dividend and inspired the founder of CCL, Marshall Saunders, to see this as the most impactful step for our climate policy. I heard a TED talk that the average person has about one gigabyte of memory, but we can buy a 20 gigabyte memory stick at Walmart for our computer for $18. So we do need to listen to qualified climate scientists and trust their opinions, because we only have so, many, so much bandwidth to memorize all of the information ourselves. So the claims of man-made science, man-made clients, so are the claims real or fabricated? Well, over 97% of the scientists tell us it's real. In the end, it will not be us, but our children, our grandchildren, and mother nature that will be the true judge. And speaking of judges, there are other worldviews out there that we find in opposition to what many, if not most of us in this audience see as obvious facts about climate change. I use this slide to remind myself that my intent is not to be confrontational with climate change deniers of the world. In fact, CCL requires us to show appreciation and respect to all, no matter how much we disagree with them. Even though people are entitled to their own opinions, but certainly not their own facts, I try not to assume people who disagree with me have negative intent. We are all a product of our own environment, and it's our job to persuade, not to provoke. Like Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, reacting in anger or annoyance will not advance one's ability to persuade. And the pug is there just because if I ever get frustrated, I just think of the pug and I feel a little bit better. Now, I know this slide seems a little off topic, but please stick with me. JFK gave you a stirring moon speech to Congress on May 25th, 1961. His goal was for the USA to land on the moon by the end of the decade. Apollo 11 landed on the moon and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon on July 20th, 1969, which happened to be my 11th birthday. A little over eight years after his speech, it was a little over eight years after his speech, 
A little known fact is that the average age of those in mission control at the time of the moon landing was 26. Of course, that means that many of the NASA engineers were teenagers when JFK gave his speech. The takeaway from this, great, even seemingly impossible things can happen in a short time with political will and participation of average individuals like you and me. So it would be difficult to have a serious discussion on any, of any kind without taking a few thoughts from the great poet philosopher Homer. Homer Simpson, that is. So Homer most likely, likely only thinks about the well-being of his hometown of Springfield. But our challenge is to help our neighbors that may not believe in climate change to think globally, not just locally. And not just about today, but the next century and beyond. In fairness, we all have a little, we all have a little Homer Simpson in us. Perhaps that's why he's so popular. But today have, might, might have been a bluebird day here in Montana but many coastal cities and several islands and even some nations may be underwater in our lifetimes. We're not just talking about today and time or Montana and space, but a very fragile and interwoven worldwide ecosystem dependent on stable events calculated over centuries and millennia. We're all in this together, you, me, and Homer. I know the title of my talk is Effects of Climate Change on Animals, and I promise we'll get there, but this is a very important slide. So where are we with the politics of climate change? Our politicians are very divided, but we do have a chance to make progress in this Congress with the 2021 Budget Reconciliation Bill, which could be a topic of discussion on its own. But I'll just say that the sprawling 2,700-page bill represents the largest investment in climate resilience in U.S. history. Please don't ask me to explain how it works because all I know is that the reconciliation bill is a very complex process. That's way above my pay grade to explain. But if the bill passed, it would put the United States on track to meet President Biden's commitment to have greenhouse gas emissions and create an 80% clean energy grid by 2030. The bill is likely the last chance for big federal climate legislation in this decade. In a 50-50 Senate and a narrowly divided House, Democrats have the slimmest possible margin for error. And this is one of my favorite cartoons that speaks for itself. What if it is all a hoax? There's not enough time to go into detail about the latest IPCC report, but everyone should read it. But I I think was most remarkable in the report was put best by climate physicist Piers Forster's pair of tweets outlining the good and the bad news about the report. The bad news was familiar. We're seeing more intense and more frequent weather extremes. We're close to 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming and we'll reach it by mid-century. But the good news is that there is much more certainty that if we get to net zero CO2, its contributions to further warming are likely to stop. At net zero, the temperature change could even start to slow and go into reverse. That is, we can halt and even reverse some of the devastation we are seeing. Now on to Montana. On a local level, not to throw too many numbers at people, but Montana is expected to see fewer days below 32 Fahrenheit and more days above 95 Fahrenheit. So what does this mean for Montana? Well, climate change endangers Montana's outdoor heritage and economy. 11,000 jobs and $281 million of income are at stake due to stream closures, lost hunting opportunities, wildfires, and reduced snowpack. Precipitation is a bit harder to predict, but in general, it means more precipitation in the form of rain and less of snow in the winter. In summer, it means decrease in precipitation. This shift in precipitation will have a significant effect on plants that grow in different Montana ecosystems. And of course, you can affect plants without affecting animals. So a real world, world example of the impact of warmer temperatures and drier climates, we don't have to look any farther than a study done by the USGS on the amazing pronghorn. The following is a kind of a wonky, mind-numbing statement, but I think it's important to just bulldoze through it. The USGS mission is to monitor, analyze, and predict current and evolving dynamics of complex human and natural earth system interactions 
and to deliver actionable intelligence at scales and timeframes relevant to decision makers. What does that mean? In simpler words, the USGS and all of our scientists are here, here to help us make good decisions. It reminded me of Will Ferrell's movie, The Internship, where he had the words, make reasonable choices tattooed in Sanskrit on his neck. Leave it up to Will Ferrell. But this would be a good idea for all of us, especially our members of Congress. Does everyone know, by the way, that Will Ferrell graduated from USC and has actually presided over at least one Trojan graduation ceremony? I guess you can't judge a book by its cover. But So what did the USGS study say? In a nutshell, average temperatures in the Southwest have increased 1.6 degrees centigrade since 1901, and the area affected by drought from 2001 to 10 was the second largest observed since 1901. Drought conditions have reduced the availability of vegetation, impacting the survival of pronghorns and putting the long-term viability of the species in question. In the Rocky Mountains, climate change has raised summer temperatures 0.72 degrees Fahrenheit each decade over the last 30 years. While snows are melting earlier in spring, wildflowers bloom several days earlier with peak flowering occurring earlier. No one knows what this might eventually mean for pollinators. So I warned you this talk was a mile wide and an inch deep, but obviously other parts of the world are also seeing effects on wildlife. In Australia, warmer winters are forcing mountain pygmy possums out of hibernation earlier than their prey, the bogong moth, so many are starving to death. In Europe, the roe deer whose fertility is triggered by the length of days are given birth after the first flowers, which are blooming earlier than in the past. This mess match of 36 days between birthing times and food availability is resulting in a decline in the deer population. The list of climate change effects on animals, animals around the world is endless. A few more comments specific to Montana wildlife. Deer and elk will stay in the high country for longer periods, both because they seek cooler temperatures and they'll not be pushed down by early winter snowfalls. Migration patterns will change as autumn drags on longer and the spring comes earlier. Less snowpack in the high country means less runoff in our streams in late spring and early summer. Stressing fish because of high stream temperatures and lower stream levels. The runoff will come earlier, stressing native fish as they compete against invasive species that are better suited to warmer waters. This of course affects Montana hunters and anglers in a variety of ways. So low flows and high water temperatures have driven, been driven primarily by very snow, low snowpack, water supply and inflows to the river. In addition, much hotter air temperatures have spiked water temperatures in the Smith River above 77 degrees this year. I used to be a swimmer and I've swum in pools colder than that. Water temperature of 77 degrees or more can be lethal to trout. Cutthroat and bull trout are very sensitive to temperature change. This happens to be a picture of a bull trout or a brown trout that is a bit more tolerant. And I just thought this was interesting, so I left this slide in. The term hoot owl comes from logging operations in the early 1900s. During the summer months, western forests were extremely dry and hot, and fire potential is correspondingly high. Loggers working in the forest to cut and move trees used a variety of equipment that generated sparks. To help prevent fire when conditions were extreme, loggers would stop our operations in the afternoon to avoid working in the driest and hottest parts of the day. Morning hours were somewhat safer because of dew and cooler temperatures. Working in the early hours, people would encounter owls that were also active in the morning, thus the term hoot owl. This was a really hard slide to keep in because it's so sad, but another large ruminant is the moose. Warmer temperatures in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont have kept biologists busy. What we've seen in the last seven years of our study, they said, is that what ticks do to a calf. The calves are born in May, they come to their first winter, and then it's the onslaught of ticks in March and April that kills the calf. 60 to 90,000 ticks are found in these massive animals, each one draining a milliliter of blood. They're losing so much blood from being fed on by the ticks that a moose can't replace that blood fast enough. Go to, go to the next two slides. Go to the next one. 
I think we'd be remiss to talk of climate change without at least a brief mention of the effects on our amazing worldwide coral reefs. Coral reefs are made up of colonies of hundreds to thousands of tiny coral, corals called polyps, which are actually invertebrate animals. The UN has warned that if global temperature rise reaches 1.5 centigrade, 90% of the world's coral reefs will be wiped out. I've witnessed this change in my lifetime. I scuba dived in some amazing reefs when I was in my teens, but the last time I swam near a coral reef, the contrast was staggering. The current pace of climate change could stretch coral reefs beyond their adaptive limits. Even if nations succeed in limiting global warming to 1.5 centigrade, above 1990 levels, the target of the 2018 Paris Agreement, 70 to 90% of reefs will be lost according to the IPCC. And that target is looking more and more unrealistic. If climate warms to two degrees centigrade, the panel projects loss of greater than 99%. Still researchers are confident that with human assistance and a global drop in emissions, reefs can avoid extinction. extinction. Now, this is an amazing story. The Rufa red knot, I'd never heard of this bird before, but apparently it's a master of long distance aviation. His wingspan is only 20 inches and they fly 9,300 miles from south to north every spring and repeat the trip in reverse every autumn. They make a pit stop in Delaware to feed on horseshoe crab eggs. In 2014, FWS listed the bird as threatened in response to climate change and its effect on migratory timing. So in our discussions of climate change, we sometimes bring up an obscure species of animal and say, well, do we really care if a roof of red knot disappears from the planet? I hope that all of us would respond by saying that we're all connected in an in ecosystem that is an intricate web, a massive rhizome of connections, the three-legged stool that the health of the planet sits on. So yes, even the most obscure and unknown species is important. A global loss of biodiversity is a major problem that could be, of course, the topic of many discussions. In order to add a little more drama, we can say a few things about the cheetah. It's the world's fastest land animal and it's facing a speedy decline in population numbers in the face of climate change. It's currently listed as vulnerable. In some areas, the cheetah's prey populations are declining. As a result of this, cheetahs have had to change their diets and prey on other animals that live in the same environment. And a rise in global temperatures has even affected the big cat's ability to reproduce. Some studies have shown that the male cheetahs have lowered testosterone levels. In some instances, cheetahs, sperm counts were seen to be almost 10 times lower than your average house cat. Now, if that's not a slap in the face. Oh, I'm and I sorry, I thought I took this slide out, but you never know what will pop up when you do a Google, Google search. But the more I thought about it, has anybody heard from the cheetah girls lately? Is climate change even having an adverse effect on our pop icons? Just a little more food for thought. So let's move on. I know, Laura, I know. Back to animals, this time domestic animals. Dog's pant is a means of cooling. When a dog gets hot, it will open its mouth and breathe heavily. As water evaporates from the dog's tongue, the nasal passage and lungs, this helps lower its body temperature. Dogs actually sweat through their paws. These pictures are of dark colored dogs that are most susceptible, but considering the fact that all dogs have fur and limited sweat glands, any colored dog is susceptible to heat exhaustion. I'm very cautious not to take my dog out on hikes if the temperature is even above 70s, high 70s or low 80s, unless I'm near a stream or a lake. What do you do if you suspect your pet is in danger of heat exposure? The most important measure is if you're outdoors on a hot day, always have your dog near a source of water, like a river, lake or drainage ditch. I once, remember this very well, did a post-mortem on a dog that was owned by a very responsible owner who hiked her dog on a hot day away from a water source, and he died of heat exposure. I did a post-mortem because, post because I was looking for other possible causes for the sudden death of the dog, but the dog's internal organs were so hot that I remember it was uncomfortable with me to keep my hand on the dog's liver. 
And I can remember seeing the Mustang Hidalgo in the movie, 2004 movie of that name with Viva Mortensen. The Mustang is seen walking bravely on the Arabian desert in a race against pure Arabian horses, pure blood Arabian horses. Now there are some horses like Arabians that are better adapted to dehydration and high heat and I can remember from vet school that camels can actually function while being 30% dehydrated because their RBCs actually change shape and allow them to fit through capillaries in a dehydrated state. But the average mammal can only tolerate 10% dehydration. Horses in general do not do well in hot dehydrated environment. In other words, in extreme heat, animals don't put on a stiff upper lip and go on. They dehydrate, they colic, and then they die. Horse veterinarians learned a lot about ice water effects on hot horses during the hot, humid 1996 Atlanta Olympics. I couldn't find a picture of ice water slurry, but this gives you an idea that horses can handle cold water, even when they're hot. After the cross country phase of the three-day competition in Atlanta, horses were doused with ice water slurries and forced to stand in front of huge fans in order to bring their body temperatures down. Bad things definitely happen to hot horses. So a few small animal specific diseases dogs in Montana may have to face. Heart room disease is possible in Montana, but I've only seen it a few times. It's a terrible disease. These worms actually live in the chambers of the heart of a dog and they can be over a foot long. One dog I saw was brought in from Nicaragua. One dog came from Hurricane Katrina 16 years ago and once from a Humane Society dog imported from California. So I won't say never, but it's rarely diagnosed in a native Montana dog. But with climate change, it is certainly a possibility that Montana veterinarians may soon start seeing heartworm disease in Montana dogs. Lyme disease, very common in other parts of the country, but to the best of my knowledge, it has not been diagnosed in Montana dogs but it's relatively common on the East Coast. When I practiced in Pennsylvania in the late 90s, I did diagnose it in the joint fluid of the elbow of a very talented jumping horse, because lameness is one of the symptoms. But I have the good fortune of not being an expert on many things like heartworm disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease. In fact, I'm very inexperienced in treatment of many insect vector diseases. But with climate change, I may need to refresh my knowledge. Fleas, the bane of most Midwest vets' existence, but certainly a great source of income for veterinarians and the flea and tick industry. The most common flea affecting dogs and cats in the U.S. is the common dog and cat flea, Tinocephalides. While fleas may be found anywhere in the country, Montana is one of the top five states where fleas are not found. But with warmer weathers, weather in the winter months, fleas may become part of our Montana community. And as fleas become more common in other parts of the country, they could have a greater, a greater chance to infest Montana dogs and who leave and return to Montana. We could go into lots of detail on entomology, but simply put, warmer temperatures mean more favorable conditions for fleas and other insects. JAVMA is a very well-respected journal in the veterinary profession. In its July 2021 edition, it includes a report from the Companion Animal Parasite Council. To summarize, it basically states that prevalence of diseases like heartworm, Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, and aplasmosis are growing. For now, this most significant increase in these vectors and the associated diseases in the East, Southeast, and Midwest parts of the US. But this trend definitely should be monitored by human and veterinary health professionals. More on this trend can be found at their website, capcvet.org. So tragically, we know that the magnificent monarch is threatened by climate change and deforestation. The population of monarch butterflies that migrated south to Mexico to hibernate fell 26% in 2020 compared with the previous year. Scientists saw the migration as a proof of insect evolution a brittle organism that could fly 6,000 miles a year to avoid severe weather. Now the monarch has morphed into a different kind of a symbol, one of the world's oldest 
most resilient species could be destroyed by climate change. Monarch butterflies need milkweed plants to lay their eggs. More than beautiful, monarchs contribute to the health of our planet. While feeding on, on nectar, they pollinate many types of wildflowers. Monarch butterflies are also an important food source for birds, small animals, and other insects. My wife and I plant several milkweed plants in our garden to attract monarchs, something we could all do. So let's talk about what we know about climate change. As a strategy of discussion, I usually try to stick to factual assertions. Example of a factual assertion. In the 2010 Gulf of Mexico BP oil spill, more than 200 million gallons of crude oil was pumped into the Gulf of Mexico for 87 days, making it the biggest oil spill in US history. 11 people were killed and 17 injured. These are factual assertions. Another factual assertion specific to climate change. We know that 97% or 30 to one of our climate scientists believe that climate change is man-made. A well-respected climate scientist who has been on the advisory council of CCL refuses to publicly debate the climate change denier one-on-one -on, -one on the issues because a one-on-one -on -one debate creates an illusion that science, scientists are divided one-to-one -one on climate change. Not true. The elephant in the room factual assertion. From fossil fuel records, scientists can correlate the amount of coal, oil, and natural gas that humans have extracted and burned with the increase in atmospheric CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Fortunately or unfortunately, we know that the oceans have absorbed a large percent of this CO2, which is causing acidification of the oceans and the problems that come with what we saw in the coral reef slide. So we know the problem and yes, we know the solution. If the problem is too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, then the solution is to stop putting them in the atmosphere. Economists tell us if you want to get rid of something, the fastest way to do it is to make it more expensive. They point to the example of cigarette smoking. Almost 50% of Americans used to smoke. Now it's in the teens. The fossil fuel industry gets 18 to $20 billion per year in subsidies from the US government actually making fossil fuels artificially less expensive. It has been called the largest market price failure in history. The most ironic thing is that 70% of Americans are in favor of a price on carbon. The majority of American families would actually benefit from the carbon fee and dividend in the form of a monthly dividend check to offset the cost of the carbon fee. Studies show that a monthly carbon cashback payment are enough to essentially cover increased costs of 87 or 85% of American households. Citizens Climate Lobby founder Marshall Saunders said it best. Ordinary people like you and me have to organize, educate ourselves, give up our hopelessness and powerlessness and gain the skills to be effective with our government. Our vision is simple. A livable world. We know that most politicians don't create political will. They respond to it. And that it's our job as citizens to create so much political will that politicians have no other choice than do, to do what we ask of them. If we're not talking with those politicians who disagree with us, then you have to ask yourself, who is? In DC, there are four paid energy lobbyists for each member of Congress. In the absence of citizens, Congress only hears from industry, party, and paid lobbyists. CCL teaches citizens how to empower themselves, how to develop relationships with their representatives so that we can help Congress see there's political will for carbon fee and dividend legislation. We endeavor to show people that our voices will make a difference. CC alone has hundreds of chapters across the US, all working to build relationships with Congress to pass carbon fee and dividend. Exercise your own political power as a constituent by calling, writing, or meeting with your member of Congress. Encourage others to do the same. Remember, not all politicians lead. If we aren't talking to them about what we want, who is? If you want to do one thing today that has a huge impact, then I'll ask you to write your member of Congress. Get informed on the Climate Reconciliation Bill. 
that may be our last chance this day, decade to do anything meaningful about climate change. Exercise your own personal power by talking about this issue with others and doing things to reduce your carbon footprint. So my daughter was a gymnast in high school and seems in this picture as comfortable on her hands as, her, as on her feet. I guess she saved me lots of money on new shoes over the years. This is a picture of her on the Grand Tetons on the left and froze to death plateau on the way to Granite Peak here in Montana on the right. Just another reminder why I'm here talking about climate change. So I wanna ask you again, why are you here? What do you savor that you want to preserve for your children? We do live in a beautiful world, but to quote a good friend, it's not infinitely plastic. Naomi Klein in her book, This Changes Everything, states that we know that if we continue on our current path, allowing emissions to the rise every year after year, climate change will change everything about our world. Major cities will very likely ground, ancient cultures will be swallowed by the seas, and there is a very high chance that our children will spend a great deal of their lives fleeing and recovering from vicious storms and extreme droughts. And we don't have to do anything to bring this about this future. All we have to do is nothing. The director of global policy for the Nature Conservancy gave a video and a Q&A to his eight-year-old son's second grade class. Predictably, they were not as concerned with carbon pricing or 10 point plans. They wanted to know what the world would, be, world would be like without a place for grizzlies, orangutans, toucans, and wolverines. Climate change is not a special interest for our politicians to debate. It's a human interest to be addressed here and now. Thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Scott, for uh, a, a broad, a broad but but excellent talk. Um, and uh, just looking for questions in the um, chat, but if, if anybody has additional ones, please um, enter them or uh, you can unmute yourselves first. Uh, there is one from uh, Marion, which says, have you seen effects of air pollution on dogs and cats in your practice? Um, not, not really here in Montana. Um, uh, that I would attribute to if you're not, maybe maybe smoke. Um, a lot of most people I could think are are wise enough to keep their dogs <laughs> indoors when it when the smoke level is is extremely high. Um, so I I honestly can't say that we have seen a lot of firsthand health effects from from forest fires, which is good news. But you know. I think that's primarily because people keep their dogs out of those environments when, when they do know the weather is bad or when the smoke is bad. Maybe also because uh, dogs and cats don't live as long and so they don't have as much time to uh, accumulate damage from polluted air. Right. Yeah, that's true. Let's see what else. Um, I don't see other questions in the chat. Uh, does anybody have a question that they want to ask Scott? I mean, I have one uh, question, which is um, about uh, environment and uh, habitat, I guess. One thing that I, it seems like you didn't talk about because it wasn't the focus directly was habitat preservation and uh, how this can provide uh, I guess, refugia for animals that are stressed by high temperatures or something like that. I mean, uh, do you wanna briefly touch on at least wild animals and uh, if there's anything we can do in our personal lives or uh, ways to address this particular issue? Um, as far as as far as ecosystem health for animals? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically uh, preserving habitat, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I tried to touch a little bit on, uh, since fishing is such a, a big pastime in Montana, I tried to touch on fishing restrictions, um, the hoot owl restrictions in, in some of the summer months when the temperatures go above 
uh, I think it was 73 that I mentioned, then they do, the, they do recommend that people don't fish um, because it's too stressful on the fish if you catch them. And, and the bull trout and the cutthroats especially are very susceptible to, to increased temperatures. Um, native, the native fish, some of the non-native fish like the brown trout are not as sensitive. But um, yeah, I mean the water temperature and that, that's, that's more of a, a macro problem than a micro. I mean, it's, the rivers are, are a temperature or a function of the environment. And so um, I don't know there's anything we can do with that uh, as individuals. We just have to, you know, deal with it on a macro scale. And as far as the, you know, the other large animals, um, you know, the elk and the deer, I tried to touch on that too, as far as their migration patterns and breeding patterns. Um, they're they're uh, conditioned to move with temperature and move with snowfall. And if those snowfall and, and temperatures are are abnormal, then then uh, they follow the weather and, and they don't act normally. So yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, I, I think they're functional right now, but I, th I think if we end up with some of the uh, temperature changes that they predict worst case scenario, then we'll see more migration pattern problems and more breeding issues. But I'm certainly not an expert on, on elk <laughs> habitat preservation. Well, one thing I've heard for um, a stream uh, trying to increase, uh, decrease stream temperatures is to have increased uh, high mountain storage of water for later in the season um, so that it can be released and uh, keep temperatures lower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Laura Jackson. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I, you know, this has been unfair to Scott, but I was just thinking about the general changes that affect, um, you know, food availability for all of us, including human animals, and the water supply. And it seems we are very short of data about those issues, really, and how those are going to change within the state. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have a cat who wheezes. Does the cat wheeze more on smoky days? It's hard to tell. And we're, we're really short of research data on so many things that uh, we have the trends, but, and maybe it isn't relevant. I mean, you mentioned science-based, and I guess that was what I was, when we know the science in the largest terms, and how do we, I mean, as a scientist um, and a practice, and how do we shift people's response patterns? Yeah, your, your question was a little bit interrupted with the feed here, but um, I think you mentioned cats and how do we monitor scientifically what's happening with their respiratory system. Yeah, we do. I mean, cats are a little more susceptible to things like feline asthma. And I, I would say we probably... Uh, see more respiratory problems with cats than with dogs, which is just a species difference. But how you monitor that and quantify it, I, I don't know. I mean, that's more of a, uh, of a project for a research veterinarian, um, maybe at a university or a research center. But yeah, it's definitely something where I would assume that if we're seeing, you know, uh, problems in humans with uh, CO2 and, and some of the other uh, air pollutants, you're gonna see a parallel with that in, in cats and probably dogs and horses eventually, and all, all animals, we're all mammals. So I would think that you would definitely see, see some of those problems paralleling what we're seeing in the human population. It's just that as far as I know, nobody's ever done a study on it. I had a question about cooling down dogs because I, I didn't, I was listening to what you were saying when you had the slide about it um, and not reading so much. And uh, I have one older dog who, um, when it gets hot, he, he continues panting for quite a long time after uh, we're done with the walk. And I was wondering about like ice packs or something like that to bring in the vehicle to cool him down quickly. Would that be dangerous or would that be something that could work? 
No, I think I think anything you can do to bring their body temperature down, and and if you can get ice packs on the large blood vessels on the on the medial inside of the of the rear leg or the front leg where the the axillary and the femoral veins and arteries are, that's the best place to get close to uh, to large blood flow. But I think the best way is just to get them submerged in a in a body of water that will actually cool down their entire body. And and I think the best thing is prevent prevent them from getting overheated in the first place. Prevention, you know, onset of prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure, you know, as the saying goes, because you don't want your, you don't want your dog to start getting overheated because then it's a downward spiral. And it's, it's, you know, in dogs, um, it can happen in, in a, in a relative hurry. As I said, the one patient I remember really well, um, the client was very responsible and she just was away from a water source and her dog died in a relatively short period of time from heat exposure. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. Are there any more from the floor or should we just say thank you very much for a really, really good uh, presentation. There are quite a few thank yous in the, in the chat and uh, um, well, and Thanks for taking the time for coming and doing this presentation. Thanks to everybody for attending too. Yeah, thank you everybody for your attention. And um, yeah, and I think this is a huge problem. I think it's like any problem, we, we just take it one piece at a time and solve it. You know, I always taught my kids there's a solution to every problem and there's definitely a solution to this. We just need to take it one, one step at a time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm going to um, end this meeting and um, uh, goodbye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.